Alexei, Alexei Navalny, the Russian dissident who's been in jail in Moscow for a long time, suddenly died today uh, of un strange circumstances. And of course, everybody is uh, immediately in the West is saying, well, he was killed by Putin. Uh, it definitely didn't happen the way that they said it was. It's just no one really even cares what the details are. They just assume that Putin did it because it was a Putin critic. Now, certainly it could be true because Vladimir Putin has definitely offed quite a number of his uh, political adversaries over time uh, and many others even outside of Russia. So it's entirely possible that that's accurate. Uh, it's also somewhat conceivable that it was the other way around, that he actually did have a some kind of a, an aneurysm or who knows what heart attack. It's, it's really impossible to say. No one knows at this point. But we want to look at the, the, the really the bigger issues today. And first of all, let's, I want to specifically look at Novelty and what he stood for and what he was trying to do. Uh, and then, you know, the fact that he was in prison. And then secondly, we're going to look at uh, a different side of the aspect from our side, because, you know, the, the West is runs to these morally indignant positions where they uh, accuse Russia of all these kinds of things. But we have some double standards that are pretty glaring. We're going to talk about here in a minute. But first things first, uh, I want to bring on Scott Horton. He is the director of the Libertarian Institute and, and uh, host of the Scott Horton podcast. You've seen him on here before. Uh, a well-known, outspoken advocate for the truth, no matter where it goes. And that's why we like to have him on the show. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, sir. Happy to be here. Uh, so let, let's look at, first of all, what, what happened with, uh, with this situation with Novelty. Now, uh, there was a video out just a couple of days ago uh, where, uh, the, in fact, the last known video of him, public video of him alive, just uh, last Thursday, uh, he seemed to be in pretty good spirits. So it's certainly not out of the question to suggest that something nefarious happened because, as I said many times, it has, has happened before. Uh, but the, the next thing I want to show is just this, this heartbreaking video of his wife pleading for some kind of justice. I would like Putin and all his staff, everybody around him, his government, his friends, I want them know that they will be punished for what they have done with our country, with my family and with my husband. They will be brought to justice and this day will come soon. Scott, I wonder if you could just uh, kind of stop in here for a second before we get into some of the Western response. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what Navalny was doing, what, why was he in jail at all, uh, and, and what was his, his story, basically? Well, um, I mean, first of all, I think the real question, well, one, one important question is, you know, the responsibility of a government when somebody dies in their prison, and especially when that person is a political prisoner. And uh, I don't think there's really any question that this guy is, and especially sends to hard labor up in the Arctic Circle. Um, but, you know, the, the problem with him from the American point of view is that he's a puppet of the U.S. government. And so, you know, he's their kind of cause celeb or whatever they call that, um, <clears throat> that they try to promote him as a possible alternative to Putin and this kind of thing. So they're very disappointed, even though they never could have had that. They seem to believe that they could have, which goes to show the American establishment's mindset when it comes to Russia, that if they think they could get a regime change in Moscow, they would take it. And then this guy is, if you look at his actual history, he's not any kind of liberal Democrat, like they would say, he's not a moderate rebel. He's a, the kind of right-wing nationalist that they would detest. It's just that he's to the right of Putin and so has had an alliance with liberals who are to the left of Putin on the basis of just being an anti-Putin alliance. So a lot of times when you'll see, you know, uh, sometimes even American backed, uh, but not always, uh, protests against Putin, you'll see kind of, you know, liberals from the suburbs and, and in town 
um, kind of lining up with these right-wing nationalists. And this is a compromise that the Americans and that the Russian liberals have made, that they want to pad their numbers and build up their movement by including these people who are, in fact, to the right of Putin. And this guy, Navalny himself, he supported the war in Ukraine uh, after, of course, Ukraine really started the war by attacking the East in 2014 after the coup. He supported Russia's effort to uh, back the East and and to intervene in that conflict, and you know has taken different positions and has said like ethno nationalist stuff, denouncing and and scaremongering about Muslims and that kind of thing that normally would anger the American you know uh, mm. tea and crumpets crowd or whatever. But in this case, he's against Putin, so they want to overlook that. They'll call him a moderate rebel even. Uh, when he's really to the right of what they could, would possibly tolerate were he to be in power. Now, I, if, is I, if my understanding is correct, uh, he was a, a fairly fringe uh, political dissident, even within Russian politics, because he was actually elected to some offices. Uh, but I, I, I think I saw that he was getting maybe 2% of the support of the Russian people who are overwhelmingly behind Putin anyway. Uh, right. So it's, it, some people have suggested that he, he wasn't really a threat to Putin, uh, not a real threat, not like, say, Prigozhin, who, who right. you know, almost led a coup. Uh, so that made a little bit more sense. Some some have suggested that because he was other thing that's important to point out that uh, not only was in jail, but he was still allowed to communicate with people outside. So Putin didn't actually shut him all the way down. Yeah. Uh, he just put him in prison. So some would suggest he didn't have any Putin didn't have motivation to kill him. But then sometimes you don't really need motivation if you're in power. How, how do you see that part of this story? Well, I mean, they claim that Putin tried to kill him before with this poisoning plot, which does not add up at all. And I have a bit of a treatment of it in my upcoming book where, you know, I don't know if the Russian side of the story that he was just in diabetic shock is really right. But I think it's the most plausible explanation at this point. I mean, he said he had diabetes previously. And the idea that they had, uh, you know, this long running string of failed poison plots that we're to believe in here and that they poison the guy's underwear and all of this stuff is, is just very implausible to me. And, you know, Fred Ware, who's the longtime Moscow reporter for the Christian Science Monitor, gave a really interesting interview to the journalist Aaron Matei, where he just talked about, as you're discussing here, Navalny's not worth killing for all the trouble, especially on in terms of all the international pressure and all of these kinds of things, um, that Putin would have far more to lose by working hard to marginalize a guy like that compared to just ignoring him. When, as you said, he has something like 2% national support. Nothing, you know, like, it'd be like taking a famous YouTuber and saying, oh, no, he's the leading critic of the government <laughs> and whatever. Like, look, Danny Davis is great, but he's not about to be the president and he doesn't need to be eliminated on that basis. You know what I mean? Um, right. that's basically the deal. And so I think his best showing was he lost with 20 something percent, 23 percent of the vote in a run for mayor of Moscow. But that was the his best showing. That's close he got. Yeah there's nothing like a massive political party that he leads that is determined to put him into the presidency or has anything like what numbers in the Duma or, or any kind of thing to make him prime minister or any yeah. kind of important national position. He's not that kind of a threat. On the other hand, though, it is important to note again, how much the Americans seem to keep daydreaming about that. You can find John O'Brennan known otherwise as the leader of Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria and the man who framed Donald Trump for treason, uh, saying, oh, it's John Lennon's birthday. And as we sing, imagine, we can just imagine. And then one of his stupid things was, I forgot, whatever, Jolani replaces Assad in Syria. No, I'm making that up. But um, one of them was that Navalny, that Navalny would be the president of Russia. And this is a guy who was part of this Yale leadership program, which is, you know, pretty obviously a CIA front or something along those lines, National Endowment for Democracy type front. And there's a reason. I mean, look at the reaction in America today to the guy's death. There's a reason that all the American establishment loves him so much. You know, what I mean, yeah. he's their guy. And, and let, let's actually take a look at some of that because uh, we're going to show you a, a couple of clips of, of both Biden and Blinken uh, in their reaction to it. And uh, we're going to have some interesting takes on that. First of all, here's what the president said. 
We don't know exactly what happened, but there is no doubt that the death of Navalny was a consequence of something that Putin and his, and his thugs did. And to be clear, you warned Vladimir Putin when you were in Geneva of devastating consequences if Navalny died in Russian custody. What consequences should he and Russia face? That was three years ago. In the meantime, they faced a hell of a lot of consequences. They've lost and or had wounded over 350,000 Russian soldiers. They've made them in a position where they've been subjected to great sanctions across the board, and we're contemplating what else could be done. So a couple of things from there, Scott, that, that are, are only indirectly related. But the first of all is that you have, again, the, the ex examination that a lot of the things that uh, the president say, and Biden was one of the worst egregious uh, violators, though certainly not the only one, where they say these bold statements, and then when they're asked to actually back them up, there's nothing there. So the guy asked him, and I've seen this on a lot of people have been tweeting about this. You said that there would be you know, horrible reactions if Novel never died, now he has. So what are you going to do? And he's like, oh, that was three years ago. So and basically, oh, well, they paid a lot of price with the Russian war, which is completely unconnected to anything about Novelty. So yeah. basically he's saying, yeah, I didn't really mean that when I said it. And people pay, pick up on that, especially our adversaries. Yeah, well, and thank goodness he doesn't mean it, because what else can he do? And if he was a little less seen. Oh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Let me clarify. I'm not saying he should do something. I'm saying no, he I shouldn't understand. say that three years yeah. ago. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, that's the truth. And, and maybe it's better that America's revealed as a paper tiger when it comes to this frontier and that one that we're actually only going to push so far because everybody knows the limits. And you know, he might have also just said, listen, man, we put every sanction on Russia we could possibly put on them. There's no more sanctions to put. Otherwise, we'd be announcing some new sanctions today. But man, we're just out of sanctions to sanction. Something like that. That's probably the close. Last to the that truth, didn't work right? so well. Yeah, not that they accomplished anything, but that would be the punishment, you know. Um, and, you know, they made back, if you go back a decade, they did this with Sergei Magnitsky, who was an accountant who worked for Bill Browder, the American hedge fund manager in Russia. And he died in jail on a corruption case. And they passed the Magnitsky Act, which was these massive new round of sanctions uh, against Russia. And then this really was one of the things back that helped sabotage the reset, the supposed reset at the beginning of Obama. And they passed all these sanctions and then the Russians responded by outlawing Russian adoptions to America. And it led to, you know, all these bad feelings back and forth on that. And yeah, it's a complicated does. case there. But at the very least, again, the American theory is if somebody's a political prisoner and they die in there, then you murdered them, government that we don't like. And that's the exact same thing. So in other words, Biden just said right there, we don't know what happened to the guy. All we know is it doesn't matter because Putin and his men are responsible anyway. Well, unless it's Gonzalo Lira who died in a government we don't hate, like Ukraine, but yeah. maybe it's a separate an issue. American, an American <laughs> who died. And I don't know, and, 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 Forgive me, if, if you got good sources on this, I'd like to know what are the best sources on what we know about how he was treated in prison in the time since he was last arrested. I believe they held him for a while and let him go. And he tweeted some things about I'm leaving yeah. the country now. And then they nabbed him again. And then he died in jail. And not a you know, piece out of our government. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And look, people are, you know, right. Uh, Americans are right to be you know, accusatory. I don't know if you call that, you know, um, first degree murder or man one or something, but it ain't right. I mean, they were holding him just for speaking. He's an American yeah. citizen being held in this jail and he hadn't committed anything that would be a crime in the United States of America. And he apparently was neglected to death so what the hell is that? Yeah, if this was a country that was not a friend of the United States of America, that was not a client of the United States of America, we'd be having an entirely different conversation Absolutely. about, about Gonzalo. Instead, instead, we're not having any conversation. It's just right. complete silence from the yep. White House, which ignores me. Unfortunately, Scott, that's not the worst of our double standards, which I'm going to start getting into now. Let's mm -hmm. look at what Secretary of State Blinken had to say on this novel issue. Fear of one man. 
only underscores the weakness and rot at the heart of the system that Putin has built. Russia is responsible for this. We'll be talking to the many other countries concerned about Alexei Navalny, uh, especially if these reports bear out to be true. Mm, fear and rot of one man who is afraid of him saying what he's saying and they don't want the truth. That sounds familiar, but for a little bit different reason. Uh, and that is, I know, something that's that's been an issue on, on your play for quite a number of years. And to me, especially in contrast to what's going on here, it shines a light back over on Julian Assange. And we want to talk about how Putin was afraid of this one man here. And yet here's this man, Assange, that's getting treated worse than anyone we, we have ever treated. Uh, you know, we talk about the rule of law. We talk about, you know, get your day in court. We talk about freedom of speech. And yet this man is being treated worse, worse than some kind of uh, axe murderer in, in the way he's been treated in jail and whatnot. And for those who may not be familiar, uh, let me first, I want to, I want to play something here, uh, from, from Julian Assange, uh, when he made a famous speech from the, uh, the, actually when he was essentially imprisoned in London, uh, from the, I think it was the Ecuadorian embassy. I mean, he explained why everyone was trying to get him. Watch this. Our beliefs about the world and each other have been created by the same system that has lied us into repeated wars that have killed millions. You can't build a skyscraper out of plasticine and you can't build a just civilization out of ignorance and lies. Despite an unprecedented criminal investigation and a campaign to damage and destroy my organization, 2012 has been a huge year. We have released nearly one million documents. Documents relating to the unfolding war in Syria. We have exposed the mass surveillance state and hundreds of documents from private intelligence companies. We have released information about the treatment of detainees at Guantanamo Bay and elsewhere. The symbol of the corruption of the rule of law in the West so, Scott, why, why are we afraid of Julian Assange and why would we not let him come out to either just leave him alone or at least put him on public trial just like a normal person who's up for criminal investigation instead of putting him in basically in irons and putting him in pro, uh, solitary con confinement? Well, they're making an example out of him is the reason for that. I sure ain't afraid. I think the guy's a hero. I first interviewed him back in 2010 and a couple times after that. And... I've tried to cover the case of his persecution all along as well. But, you know, people really should know the just absolute unbelievable heroic extent of the leak that he's in trouble for, especially, I mean, hell, he helped stop Hillary Clinton from becoming the president. Don't forget that. All of mankind owes him for that. But um, it, the Manning leak, the Iraq and Afghan war logs, the State Department cables, and the Guantanamo files. I mean, that stuff is just absolutely huge. And there must have been, you know, I don't know how many, tens of thousands of stories that if not based on the documents themselves, at least refer to them in for one part of the story. That, well, this much of the story is confirmed because the WikiLeaks say this or the WikiLeaks say that. And that's from the Iraq and Afghan wars and then the State Department cables for issues all over the world. I was reading through um, State Department documents on Russia's objections to W. Bush's harebrained anti-ballistic missile defense systems in Romania and Poland today. It's uh, just an absolutely unbelievable trove. And no, it's not all high treason, even by Manning against america these are, were secret and confidential level documents in other words they were not top secret they did not include sources and methods and names of american spies behind enemy lines to be wrapped up and killed and and all of those kinds of things like in the the scaremongering fantasies and this was just absolute pure service to journalism and yeah, yeah, no, let me ask you on that, there's, that. there's been some of the criticism for assange they said yeah but he put people's lives at risk by releasing a lot of this classified information. That have, you seen any, is that, have you seen anything in your investigation about that? Yeah, well, we know that that ain't true. I mean, so first of all, there's a kernel of truth that they base that on, which is also a lie. And that is that Assange had released documents with informants' names in them. 
that hadn't been blacked out. Well, in fact, WikiLeaks was releasing everything in batches and was very meticulously going through and blacking out the names of, say, Afghan informants, this kind of thing. And then what happened was Luke Harding, this terrible journalist, and I'm sorry, I forget the other guy's name. I'd like to accuse him too, but it's two of them wrote the thing. Um, but uh, they put out a book, uh, Guardian journalists put out a book that had um, the secret passcode to the raw files that WikiLeaks was only sharing with credentialed journalists to go through and do careful reporting on the documents. Well, these guys published that secret passcode in their book as a, a chapter title. So at that point, anyone in the world could get the documents, the raw documents without the redactions. And um, Assange knew that this was a risk and had warned the State Department and had tried to get them to intervene and they wouldn't do anything about it. And then so all this happened. But mm. for them, it's just a talking point to try to make uh, Assange look bad. But then in the reality, at the court martial of Chelsea Manning, the prosecution had to admit that they had no evidence that anyone had ever been killed or punished in any way for being identified in the WikiLeaks, in the war zones in Iraq and Afghanistan. And Secretary Gates himself said, those claims are significantly overwrought. In other words, Ooh. they didn't have a single example. It's just like when they said, oh no, all the NSA spying saved us from all these terrorist attacks. And then it turns out all they had at the end of the day, at the end of the day was some, some schmuck sent money to Somalia. You know, it was all they had. Well, now let me ask you this, Scott, because especially since you've interviewed him a few times uh, back when he was still free, how would you characterize the service to the U.S. vice the risk to the U.S. that he provided by having information that our government was keeping from us and keeping secret from us, which really violated a lot of our laws in my assessment. But I, I wonder how you view those two contradictory things. Yeah, well, look, I mean, I, I don't give the benefit of the doubt to the government. They say something needs to remain secret. I don't think so. And I, it's not to say that everything that happened from the release of those documents was good for everyone. I mean, it, it's, in great part, those documents helped to touch off the Arab Spring Revolution in Tunisia, which then spread around and ended up being hijacked by America and Saudi and our allies and turned, you know, Syria and Libya in, into absolute hellscapes and eventually Yemen as well. Um, but at the same time, like we have a right to know all of these things and our government doesn't have the right to keep these secrets from us anymore. They really don't have the right to... Uh, keep all these secrets about these foreign nations that they're intervening in. And so it's not like anybody went to jail or anything like that, but a lot of policies were exposed. Um, in fact, one of the stories in the Iraq war logs was how the Americans, uh, some American army GIs had gone into a house and executed the entire family, including a baby. And then they had called in an airstrike, but it hit the wrong side of the house. And so the evidence was not destroyed and they had to cover it up. But all the local Iraqis knew what they had done and they had tried to lie and lie and all that. But it all came out in the WikiLeaks, what was true. And that helped to sabotage the uh, Obama's pressure on Iraq, which I don't think was going to work anyway. Uh, but still, it was really the final nail in the coffin for Obama's attempt to get the Iraqis to let America stay after 2011 and extend the status of forces agreement. And I know a lot of hawks would say, yeah, but then that led to the rise of ISIS, but that's no, not true. It no, was Obama and his allies dumping billions into the civil war in Syria on the side of Al Qaeda in Iraq, in Syria, that then led to ISIS and the caliphate. And then Maliki himself, his <laughs> grotesque actions, you know, that undermined everything that we did. So that's that was, that was not gonna be stopped by that. Uh, I, I wanna shift gears a little bit and look at the, a different aspect of this, which, which frankly is, is angering to me. And I, I got to admit that uh, at the at the grotesque double standards that, that I think we have. Now, I'm going to show you the this clip, uh, first of all, uh, from uh, the German uh, outlet Deutsche Welle, where they were covering from the Munich conference today when this news broke and they were interviewing a number of people, uh, you know, at the conference about what they thought about Novelty, whatever. And you're going to see in, in the, the, the section I put in here a really just embarrassing double standard just on the surface of it about anti-Russian, because on the one hand, watch the first of it. In the first hand, they're going to uh, accuse Russia or they're going to point out that Russia was not even invited to this deal. Nobody wants to hear anything they have to say. And then in the last part of it, you're going to hear that Russia is accused for not connecting with the West. Watch this. 
It is a striking a coincidence that news of Alexei Navalny should come just as leaders gather here with Russia deliberately not invited here, not wanted at the global table, which is there to resolve these many conflicts. Uh, Ukraine now towering high over this. Well, this is essentially seen as uh, yet another sign of the decisiveness with which Vladimir Putin wants to disengage completely. Um, the German foreign minister actually in a, in a uh, tweet on X before she headed here, she's on her way here right now, uh, said that uh, Alexei Navalny epitomized the, free, the wish for a free and a democratic Russia like few others and that that is the very reason why he died uh, and that her thoughts were with his uh, family. Uh, so uh, clearly uh, the message is being received here that this is Russia cutting yet more ties and uh, letting any kind of illusion that there might be some goodwill or good faith on the Russian side evaporate. Goodwill on the Russian side when you just told me that they were excluded from this forum, that they don't even want to talk to them in the West and darn it all this Putin. I mean, that is so contradictory in the space of just a few seconds within one interview. It drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, especially when they spent the last 25 years saying we have to be so careful that we don't accidentally kick Russia out of Europe and towards a new alliance with China and Iran. We want to keep them in Europe as best as we can, as best as we can. And then when they blow that up with their quite contradictory policies like NATO expansion into Ukraine and this kind of thing, then they go, yeah. No, exactly. That's Russia's problem is they don't want anything to do with us. They just want to turn to the east and and turn away. And and then they use this as an example of that. I'm not exactly sure how that this is just a Western democracy would never do such a thing. You know, it, it just epitomizes yeah. the kind of stupidity that everybody comes at this stuff. You know, there's this guy, Evan Gorkovich. I'm sure I'm saying his name wrong. Forgive me. I don't have it in front of me, but he's the Wall Street Journal reporter. Do you know how to say his name, Danny? Yeah. I, I don't, but I do know what you're talking about. Anyway, so it's possible that he's a knock. That's a, a non-official cover spy inside Russia. I don't know that he's not. In And, you know, would the CIA do that? Use the Wall Street Journal as cover for something like that? Potentially, I guess. But I don't, I doubt I don't have any real reason to believe that. Uh, the The Russians say he received classified information. And that's why he's locked up. And I put out before I quit because I had to quit to get back to my book. But um, before I quit Twitter, I said, you know, Putin to Tucker Carlson invokes this standard and says, well, the guy received classified information and that's why he locked him in prison. The vile Vladimir, that was his justification. And then I says, just like Julian Assange. And I swear more than half the responses probably were along the lines of, oh, well, I guess you don't understand that the law is different in Russia and you just can't do stuff like that and whatever. When the whole point is that, no, I do understand that. And I think that Russia is a police state. And I don't think that America should be a police right. state. Right? right. Remember back 25 years ago before W. Bush in the Clinton years, Larry the Cable Guy used to be funny. You gotta go way, way back. And he would start everything with, what the hell is this, Russia? When he was talking about, you know, Janet Reno's Justice yeah. Department. What the hell is this, Russia? That's, they're supposed to be the standard of what we ain't at all times. Yeah. And then here, when I say, yeah, just like Julian Assange, people are like, hey, you know what? Those are the breaks and the rules are the rules. And yeah, the rules are, well, it's fun. But see, that, that, that gets exactly back to the point that I'm making, that I, I, this is so far from any kind of a defense of Vladimir Putin or what Russia is doing. Uh, to the contrary, I mean, I will. It's, it's very clear that they silence dissent, that they have lots of laws that don't allow people freedom of speech within their country, especially as it relates to this war. Uh, and that's what they're doing in their country. And, and I, I don't like it. I don't have to like it. But that's what they're doing here. I don't want to be that way. So when I see like Blinken having these in these moral you know, indignation about what what Russia did with Navalny while you see this issue going on here with Julian Assange, which are almost like two sides of the same coin. The same issues are generally involved here is that Assange wants freedom of speech to be able to say in journalism, here's what the truth of your government's hiding from you. And we're doing everything we can to silence him. Now, in case people aren't aware of this, because it's 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 kind of been buried under a lot of this news, apparently just a day or two from now, 
Uh, Assange is going to go before a, a judge in the UK where he's been held in solitary assignment on extradition. And mm -hmm. if he is extradited, he could be back in the United States literally within days. Now, we showed you Navalny's wife and how upset she was after he passed away. And uh, now I'm going to show you uh, Julian Assange's wife earlier today, I believe it was, where she's going to show her fears that she may end up like that. Watch this. He's, phys he's physically weak. Um, mentally, he's he's resilient. Um, but obviously, this takes a, an enormous toll. And this is, we believe, to be it to be the final hearing in the UK. Um, and if he loses, he will then be moved to the United States. The UK will move to extradite him. We know in other, other cases, the UK has extradited a person within 24 hours of a negative decision. The US can choose to torture Julian if they deem it necessary um, at a later point. It is anything but a guarantee. It is just a fig leaf to be able to torture Julian once he's extradited. But as she made clear on a separate interview, it's not just torture she's worried about, it's his physical life. His health is in decline, mentally and physically. His life is at risk. Every single day he stays in prison. And if he is extradited, he will die. Scott, we're supposed to be the example, the shining light on the hill that contrasts with, with authoritarian regimes like Vladimir Putin, which I unequivocally say that they are. We're doing the exact opposite. We should be the ones that says, okay, Julian Assange has been accused of a crime. So we're going to give him his day in court. We're going to let him have his defense and he's going to have his say. We're going to have our say. We're going to put him out there. Instead, it has been, what, something close to a decade where we've had him in solitary confinement, not allowing him to speak to anyone. At least Putin allowed Navalny to talk to people. He actually was able to communicate. Assange has been placed like the worst criminal that we can imagine with no rights, no, no ability to defend himself and anything else. And now then we're talking about bringing him here. And who knows what may happen to him right here. You see his wife is afraid he's going to die. This should not be what America is all about. Yeah, well, you're right about that on so many points. So first of all, in court, they treat the guy like Hannibal Lecter. They have him stand in this separate little fiberglass booth, all in, you know, wrist and leg shackles and all these things. Like somehow he's going to break out of there and start cutting throats if they don't have him locked down like the most dangerous terrorist. And they, the guy's alleged crimes involve sitting at a desk and typing on a keyboard. The whole thing is they treat him that way, again, as an example to others but also as public relations for the people in the room. It makes him seem like he's pretty guilty, which goes a long way in court. You know, a lot of things factor in. So, and then, yes, you're right. They, they keep him in solitary confinement. He was in, I think, even worse circumstances previously, but he's still on, I, I believe he is still on 23 hour a day lockdown on, you know, super max conditions, locked up in the Belmarsh prison in England, which is, um, you know, it's not a county jail. He's in the worst supermax type conditions along with convicted terrorists and this kind of thing. You know, people that used to work for Bill Clinton back in the day and stuff like that. Um, and then um, the thing is, too, you got to understand is once they put their hands on him, finally got him out of the embassy and arrested him and started this current process to prosecute him. The judge ruled against his extradition. Like the, I'm not exactly sure how they call their different circuits and the levels of the different court system over there in England, but the judge ruled that Assange's lawyers made a compelling case that this guy is a risk to die by uh, either neglect or by suicide because everybody knows that American supermax prisons are, uh, you know, essentially like the equivalent of what you'd think, like the cliche of a Turkish prison or some just absolute yeah. horrible dungeon hellhole. Everybody knows how the supermax is a fate worse than death and that this guy's mental health has already been diagnosed as in question by professionals here who say that he is a very likely suicide risk if they were to transfer him and prosecute him and uh, put him in in the supermax. Okay, in, so, in so why are we so deathly afraid of this one guy here? I, I mean, he's a guy sitting behind a computer. He he doesn't yeah. look like he's a real tough guy. He's not part of a movement. He's not leading a, an army of dissidents or anything like that. Mm. He just is saying what he thinks. 
Well, All this information is out there. It's been out there ever since the WikiLeaks came in. So there's no more damage he can do. Why are we afraid to give him a day in court and actually get this result? Right. Okay. Well, a couple of things there. Um, on why they're so afraid of him is because he's leading a revolution. WikiLeaks.org is journalism, right? They publish, but they don't do like the New York Times where they hold hands with the CIA and publish what they're supposed to publish in the bits and pieces the CIA wants them to publish. And it's true that the major papers sometimes get a real scoop, but mostly they're the handmaiden of the state. Here, Assange puts up raw documents by the thousands and thousands and thousands for journalists around the world to dig into. And he sets a precedent that that's possible to do in the first place, and that that is the new wave of online journalism, is these massive leaks. And by the way, people should know, he had published all kinds of leaks about American enemies too. Sometimes people accused him of being a sock puppet of America, because here he's publishing stuff about mm. Russia, stuff about Bashar al-Assad, Syria, that plays into America. American narratives. When his narrative is, I don't give a damn, I'm just a librarian of the truth. These documents are legitimate documents. And so the light of day they see, that was how he played it and called it. And so to them, I mean, what he revealed about the wars and in the State Department cables about America's relationship with almost every country in the world is enough for them. Look, Mike Pompeo and them plotted to murder him. Danny. They're going to kill the guy. And now, secondly, you talk about his day in court. The guy is charged with completely bogus, ridiculous offenses that you or your next door neighbor or anyone could just look at the indictment and the superseding indictment and just laugh. It's preposterous. He said to Manning, hey, get me some documents. And Manning said, all right, then. Well, that's what journalists do. And if um, and then they yes, if you're going to go, you're going to put half the New York Times in jail because they they That's get right. the data Washington Post every day practically. Okay, so so this is what happened, right? So in the Obama years, they called it the New York Times test, and they said we just can't indict this guy as badly as we want to. We can't because the same standard would apply to any of the newspapers that look. Think back, the newspapers that he worked with to go through the documents with him and publish stories based on them. And there's no line between his culpability and theirs whatsoever. So they dropped it. But then the Trump government came in determined to get him. You know, Mike Pompeo was the head of the CIA and they were, you know, if we're not going to kill him, we're at least going to indict him. And so what they did was they totally twisted the facts, Danny, and just made it where um, they took like innocuous things like uh, Assange tried for a moment, or maybe offered, but didn't even try, uh, but for the sake of argument, tried to help Manning crack a passcode just to cover his tracks for a little bit of deniability to make it look like possibly someone else had logged in and looked at the same data or something. But then that didn't even happen. And anyway, that's not illegal because the guy's a journalist. Now, what Manning did was illegal because Manning was a specialist in the U.S. Oh. Army, was absolutely forbidden from doing such a thing. Then Bradley, later Chelsea Manning, and was court-martialed and convicted and served time for that. Oh. But Julian Assange wasn't in the Army. Julian Assange is simply a publisher. And now, see, the Espionage Act is very broad. And it includes even you and I right now discussing classified information like that airstrike on that family in Baghdad. We could go to jail under Woodrow Wilson's law. However, it's never been enforced that broadly. It's only been enforced. And okay, but, Scott, that, okay, but, but still, your show, right? You, you cover this kind of stuff all day long and half for years and half the books you've written, maybe all the books you've written, cover this kind of stuff. So it, it would be a threat. Why Julian Assange over everybody else who's done stuff. I mean, like you said, even Manning had his day in court. He was convicted. He served his time. And well, now he's come out of that. Why okay, not so, do the same for Assange and it'll go away? Well, okay. So, the, all right. I mean, on, on that aspect of it, maybe there's just a little confusion about the situation here. It's, it's a complicated mess. But basically, they originally tried to frame him up on some charges of sexually abusing some women in Sweden, which was a complete hoax. But the charge that they got him was on bail jumping in England. And he had said that he would be perfectly happy to be questioned by Swedish authorities in England. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, man, I have to go back and forget how all that broke down. But essentially, they were insisting that he go to Sweden to be questioned. And 
at a certain timetable, he was supposed to turn himself in and instead he fled to the Ecuadorian embassy. Mm. And at that time, Ecuador was ruled by some leftists who were sympathetic to him and let him stay there. And so he was essentially in exile in the Ecuadorian embassy in London for, I forget, seven yeah. years or something like that. And then what happened was America got their regime change in Ecuador and a new, you know, the right wing party came in and kicked him out and gave the Brits permission to come in and grab him. So then now he's under indictment in Virginia um, under Trump's Justice Department had indicted him. And so then at that point, all of the long series of hearings kick in where his lawyers are the ones who are dragging this out essentially now, not to drag it out, but in effect, they're dragging it out because they keep appealing and appealing and appealing the rulings that say that they're going to give him over to America. And as I said, one of the judges ruled that this guy is is likely to die if we do this. And they're forbidden in law from doing that. And um, they already had to promise not to give him the death penalty. At first, they resisted that. But they eventually, I think, did promise not to give him the death penalty. But they still said he's a risk for suicide in this. Then the higher courts overruled that, said, no, we're going to turn him over to the Americans. So they've been appealing and appealing and appealing that process. What you talked about this upcoming court case next week, the 20th and the 21st there, this is his final appeal in England. Now, there is a European court of justice that is mostly toothless and may not even play a role here. As soon as, as you said, as soon as if the court rules against him, they may hand him right over European oh, court of justice. Uh, yeah, that, which is what his wife said in that interview we had a second ago. So mm -hmm. in the last few minutes we have here, what happens next? Let's say that he is is ex uh, extradited and he lands in Virginia here Just in a week up. or so. What happens next? He's doomed because here's the thing. They're not going to let him put on a real defense. The whole process is rigged. And he can't even say, I did it for a good reason. That's like excluded as a possible defense under the Espionage Act. So, um, you know, they're making him a spy. The headline this morning, I'll tell you, you know what, who's the very best chronicler of Julian Assange's plight here? His name is Kevin Gostola, G-O-S-Z-T-O-L-A. And he writes at the dissenter.org. And he has this huge series that he's doing in the countdown. And he wrote a book about Assange. Um, and is he's just the best. And his piece this morning is that the government is arguing the First Amendment doesn't apply to Assange because he's a foreign national. Well, but if he's a foreign national, then the Espionage Act doesn't apply to him either. Well, that's but what I was every, thinking. But. And the law says, again, well, two things. First of all, if he's under their indictment and under federal civilian police control in the federal court system, then he is a U.S. person and is protected by the Bill of Rights. And then, but secondly, they're saying, well, no, that can't be right because in this case, it's espionage and foreigners don't have the right to commit espionage, but they're just begging the question when the whole argument is that, no, he's a publisher and he's not committing espionage at all. He's simply received classified information and published it in effect, just like any good newspaper reporter would. And so, um, but I think that, look, the jury is going to be all government employees and contractors, and they're going to string him up, man. Well, I don't know. This, this just anguishes me for some of the reasons we mentioned at the top of the show here. We're supposed to be better than this. We're supposed to set the example for what true justice looks like, where everybody has their day in court, and you want to accuse him of these things? I haven't seen the evidence that the government may have. For all I know, maybe he is guilty of some of these things. But just treat him like a normal person indicted for crimes are, not solitary confinement, kept from his family and other, and treated, like you said, like Hannibal Lecter. Give him his day in court so he can defend himself and say whatever it is he's going to say, just like the government's going to say what it's going to say. But we should set the example and not wait a decade before anything even happens. Now, I understand what you said there about some of the stuff is from his team trying to delay it. But the bottom line is we're not doing a good thing here. And, and we're, the things that we're accusing Russia of, we seem to be doing a lot of. And I want to see that change. Yeah. Well, listen, no, Scott, not, I know we could keep talking about this forever. Well, just, just real quick. Sorry, on sure, one more thing. Yeah, I sure don't mean to blame his lawyers for that. They should just drop the charges and that would solve that problem. Or he could be held in the county lockup. There's no reason he needs to be in the highest security prison Absolutely in all none. of England. That's how they're treating him now, which is a crime. Right. Yeah, that's that's one of the things, because that's what looks like 
the Russians that we claim to want to be different from, because that's yep. what they would do. And in fact, that's what they were doing with Navalny. He was in a, the, you know, the hard labor and all that kind of stuff, which we ridicule. We shouldn't be doing the same things that we're accusing them of doing, but uh, we'll continue to follow this. But like, we're definitely going to keep following this because, uh, you know, whatever happens with this next court case, and definitely when it comes here to Virginia, where I'm based out of, uh, we'll be seeing what's going on there because I want America to do the right thing. And I want justice to be done, no matter what that justice turns out to be. But I want to see us set the stage. Thanks for coming on, Scott, today. I really appreciate you giving your time and your expertise. Uh, and and uh, we're going to look forward to having you back soon. Thank you very much, Danny. Really appreciate it. And I encourage everyone to just go and look at wikileaks.org. Dive in the absolute incredible amount of information there, firsthand information from the U.S. government documents themselves. Thank you very much. And uh, we thank you for joining us today. We remain unintimidated and uncompromised on telling you exactly what's going on so that you have the truth and that you can make sense of your world around you and that we can hold people's feet to the fire when they're doing things that are not good in your name. And we're going to continue doing that. You're going to want to join us on Monday uh, because we're going to have a special uh, appearance from Doug McGregor, who's going to be talking about some of the things going on in the Russia-Ukraine war as we get close to the exact two-year mark. Don't want to miss that. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I believe that's at uh, 11 a.m. on Monday. So tune in there and we'll see you next time on Daniel Davis Deep Dive.